What's up and welcome back to The Neighborhood and thank you so much for joining us on this episode. On this episode, we are going to be diving into the world of live service games. Welcome to the podcast where three longtime friends talk about video games from the average gamer's perspective. My name is Andrew Kimball. I'm Dylan Wren. And I'm Aubrey Summer. And, and we, we are, are your, your friendly, friendly neighborhood, neighborhood gamers. gamers. So... Before we jump into our topic of the show, a little bit of celebration because the gang's all here for the first time in a minute. Hey. Uh, Aubrey is back. Dylan's internet is fixed. So we are back in business. We are. We are back. <laughs> it's like that. What was that 90s movie with like the dinosaurs? Oh, Lord. Yeah, that's called Land We're Before Back. Time? No. no, no, no. It's called We're Back, oh. and it's like they're like in New I think York City, like time traveling dinosaurs. Yeah. There's a flying saucer oh. involved, but yeah, it was not that in our like regular rotation. Caleb would tell me about, and I would just forget immediately. <laughs> Unlike your household growing up, we were a pro Disney household, Dylan. So, I mean, I don't know what, whether We're Back was Disney or not. <laughs> it's most definitely not. Okay. Yeah. I don't know what, what it would have been. I, I was can, DreamWorks I know, a thing back then? <laughs> I don't uh, think so, because DreamWorks spawned have... out of Pixar, didn't it? No, no, no. DreamWorks spawned out of Disney. Katzenberg <clears throat> was overlooked for promotion to, I think, CEO when the CEO died. I think in a plane crash or a helicopter crash. And he thought that he was supposed to get that job and then... I can't think of his name, but basically someone else took it. And then Roy Disney was a part of a big kerfuffle. And anyway, Katzenberg was put in charge of the Disney animation studio, resulting in heavy, heavy cuts to the Black Cauldron. And anyway, brief, brief era up until like the late 90s, early aughts. And then he left disney and joined with spielberg and somebody else who owned a bunch of like radio studios and they made dreamworks before dreamworks it probably would have been um bluth don bluth productions and he mm -hmm. did like thumbelina the first land before time um the swan princess anastasia i was gonna say uh, i can american picture that Tale. animation style yeah, yeah it the like the character faces and the movements, lots of rotoscoping used in that. Um, and he was a Disney animator, but he left, I think, in the early 80s. So he trained under, like, the 12 old men that were, like, the original animators for Disney, like, way back when it first started. But, yeah, he he ended up selling his catalog to WB, who kept a couple pieces of it. And then Warner Brothers sold a lot of his catalog to 20th Century Fox. And then 20th Century Fox was bought by Disney. And so now a lot of Don Bluth's films are actually owned by Disney. Like everything else. Yeah. Yep. But I think it looks kind of like a Don Bluth animated thing, but I'm not positive. Hmm. I mean, all I remember about it is it had some dinosaurs in it. They were in New York. <laughs> probably or some other nondescript new york adjacent city uh and i watched it in the 90s so <laughs> but to bring it back to video games don bluth also um animated and created an arcade game called dragon's lair oh, oh yeah okay i can see the animation yep. connections yes. to dragon's yep. lair for sure so that was a don bluth outing and he's been talking ever since that basically and still brings up trying to make a dragon's lair too but it was very expensive to produce and was worth buying in like an arcade cabinet because you could recoup a lot of your losses, but not under the console market. I'm like sure that would be different now. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> I feel like he could make that now because they've done what's Cuphead and several other games that are like hand animated and whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I wouldn't say several. They've done Cuphead and I mean, there's to at be least fair, the one other. 
I can't there are cup, Cuphead clones, but I don't think the animation is mm-hmm. hand drawn. But like the, the MDHR who made Cuphead, it took them years to make Cuphead, and then it mm-hmm. took them years to make the additional island <laughs> DLC for Cuphead because of the hand drawing. Yeah, I well, and Don Bluth talks a lot. He's still, I mean, he's getting up there in years. Yeah, but he's still active on like certain social media platforms and stuff and he talks a fair bit about a lot of his projects and trying to bring them back and trying to bring back 2d hand-drawn animation which i would be all for i they've done incredible things with cgi and 3d animation and all that but there's just a charm to 2d animation that is pretty hard to beat was spirit fair hand-drawn i don't think so it, Not, it like they were like, going for that kind of vibe, but yeah, when it was pr- probably like the character designs and stuff were like made to look like that, but it was probably like 2D, 3 like digital 2D animation versus like hand drawn on paper, scanned in like traditional method animation. Gotcha. <clears throat> so, probably more along the lines of like what. I can't think what the studio is called, but it's from out of Ireland, and they did like the, the Secret of Kells and Wolf something. They've done like three really beautiful movies, where it's kind of like paper doll two D animation, but you can tell that it's not hand drawn. Mm-hmm. No, like I think he wants to like fully hand drawn like every part of it, and then it's scanned in, kind of like what they did for Cuphead. I think every sprite every asset was like a hand-drawn thing that was then put in and tied Hmm. together as needed yeah that would be quite an undertaking i thought when you said he wanted to make like a sequel it'd be like a modern interpretation of not like a literal (laughs) we're gonna do it the same way yeah that would still be yeah no i think pretty niche yeah which and i i mean dragon's lair is all quick time events without the benefit of knowing what button you're supposed to push which made it great for the arcades oh, because yeah. the failure rate was astronomical. And I think it was also the most expensive game too. Mm. Like instead of being a quarter, it was two quarters or like a whole dollar or something for a playthrough. So like there was a reason that the princess was so scantily dressed because they needed those 12 year olds to really want to play <laughs> that game. Um, But yeah, it was, it was expensive even in the arcade era. So which you could definitely get people on board like for the niche experience, but I think it's been like emulated onto like computers and stuff. Like you can play it. Oh yeah. Without needing obviously to find an old arcade cabinet, but yeah, it's it, the gameplay is not engaging enough in the modern era. I don't think for it to make enough money to be worth making unless they really changed it up. At which point you're just making another modern game with the IP attached to it. Yeah. You could do something like, a, uh, what's their name? The ones that did the quarry and Until Dawn and that. It's like, like a just do, massive. yeah, do like a super massive style game, but if in like a cartoon animation <laughs> style, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I think if you, even if you like achieve all the fail states and like beat the game and all that it's still ultimately only like 20 minutes of animation Mm -hmm. in dragon's lair yeah i actually shared a video in our discord about graphics and the history of like oh these are the best graphics ever and like pushing the limit on because it caught my eye because of hellblade and hellblade 2 that had recently come out but it actually talks a fair bit about dragon's lair and how it's it ultimately only amounts to about 20 minutes of animation yeah that's a uh Jacob Geller video who now we can talk about my like pointless knowledge was a <laughs> intern at Game Informer who then went on to spin off his own YouTube channel doing video essays that he's become extremely popular for and now he's like a consistent guest or cohort or whatever they call them on the MinMax show. Oh. So yeah he recently popped up in my recommended and I've been watching a couple of his videos they're good. Yeah they're good I think Sometimes he can be a bit pretentious, but sure. I do think that a lot of his videos are really... He does a... He, the first video I found by him was, believe it or not, Bloodborne. So what? he has a really Shocking. really good video on Bloodborne. <laughs> a video essay another, on Bloodborne and you? No. <laughs> another thing that'll shock you, like the one of the thoughts that ran through my head when you were talking about like 
doing a Corey style animated game i was like that'd be really cool to have like an elden ring like a souls like game set in like an elden ring setting but with that kind of classic animation Mm -hmm. as like that would be really cool kind of like um like sleeping beauty or something or something yeah with the way all her little like goblins looked or whatever and the like painterly Mm -hmm. aesthetic in the background yeah See, I was thinking those animated Lord of the Rings movies. (laughs) (laughs) The 70s. Talk about rotoscoping. Holy cow. Yep. (laughs) The way that they move is so... I mean, yeah, it's it's from the rotoscoping, but the way that it just translates to the weird, unnecessary movements that they do in the animation. (laughs) Very uncanny. Well... That was a great way to get the conversational blood <laughs> pumping. I, I was not expecting that uh, particular conversation, but I enjoyed it. Our main topic, however, for this episode, like I mentioned earlier on in the intro, is that we're going to be talking about live service games. This is a topic that Dylan has been kind of kicking around for a while. He plays the most of these style of games, mainly Destiny 2. I, by the most, mm-hmm. I mean like has put the most time in not necessarily Mm. that you play a variety of these games because i've obviously played my fair share and aubrey and i have played at least one game that was a victim of the live service trend so Mm -hmm. yeah we are kind of going to pontificate on this current trend in the industry and our thoughts on is it healthy do we like it do we not like it you know is it (laughs) Is it a trend worth chasing, especially when the AAA gaming industry moves so slow that by the time they release their live service game, the industry, like the the gaming community has kind of moved on from that? Like just kind of general conversation about live service in general, but I'll throw it over to you, Dylan, to kind of kick this off. Where do you want to start with this? Yeah, so this has been kind of rolling around in my mind for a while now, just because like we we've been seeing especially this year it feels like just kind of a bunch of sort of games as a service or live service games come out and come out and fail this year alone we've had skull and bones which had its own host of problems (laughs) uh but yeah but the least of which i like i think that it's the it's what everybody says when that game comes up. If they would have released it like two or three years after Black Flag, when yeah. the hype from Black Flag was still at its peak, and had just released another pirate game that wasn't yeah. associated with Assassin's Creed, like a single player pirate game, we would all look back on that game fondly. Yeah. But instead, they had to try to figure out a way to make it a living game and shoehorn like continuous gameplay to keep you playing it forever. And now here we are. Yeah, so that one came out. Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League came out. Also, basically just like shot in the foot with live service stuff from the get-go. And then Concord is kind of the most recent one that came out and, you know, had Sony pulled the plug on it after like, what, two weeks of it being out? Which is crazy. Yeah. And so, so... It's been kind of kicking around in my mind. And then so as this has kind of happened, where it feels like this is maybe the year or or like this year, maybe last year, too, is kind of just like where the straw that broke the camel's back happened uh, with a lot of gamers, where it's just kind of like for a while there, I feel like they were tolerating like live service or games as a service type stuff. And then this year, it's it feels like most of the ones that have come out have just been like bad you know and so (laughs) and i and i don't know if that's you know more about the games themselves or if it's just the live service and trying to like shoehorn it in or whatever but i figured we could have a sort of discussion about just live service games and there is a reason they exist and you know so we may get into just monetization in general as well um as we kind of do this discussion but when I say, I guess, live service games, what do you guys think of? What comes to mind? Um, not much. <laughs> like, I, I, I don't know many. I looked up a list of like, like, okay, well, can, is there a list of live service games? Because I don't want to be talking about live service games and then realize that I've been playing one this whole time. 
which I feel like I should know <laughs> if that was the case, but apparently I don't know what RPGs are, so maybe I don't know what a live service game is. But I do think of um, like Avengers mm -hmm. and how basically hearing that it's going to be a live service game kind of just kills any interest I have in it. Mostly because for me, that means it's not going to be a closed narrative mm, mm -hmm. and also means it will probably involve multiplayer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I wasn't. Two things I don't like. I wasn't sure to, because uh, I know you probably out of all of us play the most like mobile games. I wasn't sure mm -hmm. how some mm -hmm. of those were set up if they had like battle or not battle passes but like season passes or episodes or you know like if it was kind of an ongoing sort of like narrative experience or if it was if most of those were just kind of like a different beast altogether like a, a match three game or you know something yeah most of the mobile games so i play <laughs> i play mostly um merge mansion which is the one that has the plot that is no plot and um project not project runway what is it called <laughs> hold on um oh project makeover and very occasionally gardenscapes and project makeover is another one that has those outrageous like ads where she's got crazy long tangled hair and gets covered in mud and broken up with and you it shows mini games that aren't actually the game it's just like a falling gem kind of um type game very candy crush yeah and those have in-app purchases for, like, additional energy or resources or stuff like that. Merge Mansion definitely has more of it because you can use gems to buy, like, the items that you need to merge together. And you can buy, like, the items themselves sometimes. They'll have, like, bundles and stuff where you can pay for it. And they do a lot of events, but there's no, like, paid entry or anything like that. But the timed events are usually typically so short yeah. that you probably need to pay something to succeed it, like to get to the end of them. And also yeah. they'll have like two tracks where one's like, here's everything you can get if you do it for free. Here's everything you can get if you pay for it in addition mm. to the free stuff. So you still yeah. have to complete like a battle the pass. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you still have to complete the event to get all of the paid rewards. And when an event ends, it'll show you like, hey, here's everything that you earned that you can get if you give us your $10. But I haven't felt the need to pay for anything in any of the mobile games that I've played. I haven't. Yeah. Yeah. Because that those kind of like what you're describing there to me is kind of like live service light or games as a service light sort of stuff yeah. where it's it's kind of preying on that FOMO. It's kind of doing like a here is an event that is going on that if you don't play during this mm -hmm. very specific time you don't get to experience and well it's almost the flip of that where i could i think that some of the things we've seen come into the more mainstream like console gaming has come from the mo like yeah. the monetary systems in mobile gaming yeah you could see that and honestly they have they do it so frequently though that it's never like too good a thing to pass up yeah like literally one event will end and they'll be like, oh, like in Project Makeover, they'll be like, oh, your little camp out road trip thing has ended. Now it's road trip to the beach. And it's like, mm, mm -hmm. it's the exact same like mini game event or whatever. So there's always something like perpetually going on to the point where it almost like clogs up and stalls out the main game. And I'm like, I haven't run out of content in the main game yet. So I'm not, this does not appeal to me. And like, I definitely got far enough in both of them where they've had like updates where like in merge mansion they finally opened up the mansion and so you're not just renovating the grounds anymore now you're renovating the mansion Whoa. <laughs> crazy <laughs> grandma still doesn't tell you shit about what's going on but apparently their family was bootleggers at some point and then like project makeover they'll technically do seasons because the gimmick is like you're a makeover show like extreme makeover type thing yeah um so you're renovating the person and their style and the like their room or recording studio or beekeeping business or whatever. But also like I've gotten I just enjoy like the gameplay loop and I'll play it when I just have like a quiet minute to get through it. 
and I played him frequently enough that sometimes when I log on, they're like, oh, you're back. Have unlimited <laughs> lives for the next hour. I'm like, <laughs> please yeah. play the game. Anything to keep you playing. Yeah. So like I played it in front of your daughter, Andrew, and she's like, oh, what's that? I'm like, oh, it's this. You want to play it? Yeah. And I had s- enough of the currency that you earn by beating levels that she completely like got through two quote unquote episodes in like a season and pick some wild colors for that person's room. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So like they do have it, but I've mm-hmm. never like it's never felt like a pay to win type situation like yeah. some more egregious games do, which is probably why it's so popular. Well, to your original question, I think of Fortnite and mm. Destiny 2. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Are like two major games that pop in my head that have been doing their thing for years at this point and that is like they are what they are like the cash cow that all these other companies are chasing and trying to emulate because they're so successful at it but then like aubrey mentioned you try to shoehorn it into an avengers game Mm -hmm. and what ultimately ends up happening is you sacrifice story you sacrifice creating an actual interesting narrative and i'll give avengers credit for the gameplay being somewhat decent because each of the characters still kind of played uniquely which was nice i could have seen them going the route where they all kind of just feel the exact same but even so like you're shoehorning all these characters into repetitive similar missions yeah the whole story revolves around dropping into a, a level and beating things up and collecting currency and rare gear and stuff and it's like this it doesn't make sense for this world and these characters yeah which like if they had and i don't know maybe they did do this and it still wasn't enough but if they did like events or like a smaller universe which is funny to say like the batman universe when (laughs) i wouldn't have liked that if they did it with gotham knights but to release a new season where it's like, okay, and here's, you know, not that they didn't do the League of Assassins and the Court of Owls, but if they thought about it a little more, here's the League of Assassins, a bunch of missions where you get gear from that and you eventually get to the point where you do like a raid boss, like attack, like fighting the League or something. I could see that working in a superhero setting, but they don't well, the problem ever is advertise you, their you, games like that. But even if that is... I mean, that was what Gotham Knights was supposed to be until they pivoted and ended up with like this weird hybrid of a, yeah. no, it's it's not live service, we promise, but there's all these live service things in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the problem is, is that say like the Court of Owls or the League of Shadows or Assassins or whatever it is, it you're sacrificing an actual interesting character driven storyline with mm-hmm. unique missions like, oh, this is the cool stealth mission or this is the like brawler mission or this is the mission on your motorcycle or whatever and you're sacrificing that for simple stories that they can kind of chop up into segmented missions and then the gameplay of those missions being exactly the same every time because you're going to replay them for a chance at a better batarang or whatever so that you can build your meta build for the end game to do the big raid and it's just it doesn't make sense for a game that wants to tell a story like even destiny which has say a good story or an interesting lore it's impossible to watch or actually experience that story without a bunch of additional help from outside resources yeah yeah because that's uh, like that's the i think tricky thing about a lot of these games as a service or live service games especially in like the console space that we're kind of talking a lot about um, so I pulled the Wikipedia definition of games as a service, live service games. Uh, and so they that is a game that represents or it's a term that represents providing video games or game content on a continuing revenue model, similar to softwares as a service like Adobe or Word or something like that, probably. Oh, Adobe. Games as a service are ways to monetize video games either after the initial sale or to support a free-to-play model. Games released under that model typically receive a a long or indefinite stream of monetized new content over time to encourage players to continue paying to support the game. 
This often leads games to work under a games of service model called living games or live games since they continually change with these updates. So I really want my game to be like Microsoft Word. That's right. what I'm looking for in my <laughs> gaming experience. We, we've listed out some examples. You know, we, we talked about some terrible ones. Uh, there are some good ones, though. You know, like I, I personally think Destiny does a good job. Um, mm-hmm. If you ask the really hardcore Destiny nerds that play the game but hate it, they would tell you that it does not. But I mean, that's the same for any yeah, I think that's like, the same. diehard community. And the, I, yeah, I think that these games make that community worse because they, you know, have put more time and more money into these games. And so then they start, you know, it's like a sunk cost fallacy where they've, you know, played Destiny 2 for 3000 hours and, you know, they're bored of it. They hate it, but they also can't admit to themselves that like. I'm done with this game, you know, because they constantly need it to like keep getting better. I don't think it's totally inappropriate though to feel some sense of ownership or entitlement over a product like that if you've given it like hundreds of dollars. Yeah. I'm not like obviously there's like reasonable and unreasonable expectations and like just don't be a jerk in general, but also like I feel way more of eff- like <laughs> Part of why Gotham Knights felt so egregious is because I bought it at lunch and I spent seventy two dollars on yeah. that game, yeah. not well, fifteen, like or even uh, you know Game Pass or something like that. Like, yeah. yeah, would it still have been just as bad if I'd only spent fifteen bucks? Of course, but I spent seventy two. Yeah, well, and I'm definitely not saying like you can't be upset if a game doesn't live up to it. Uh, sure. That said. It's usually like, at least with Destiny, it usually seems like it goes in the like, you know, everything comes out, it gets good reviews, they put 200 hours into it, and then they're like, I've done everything, there's nothing left to do. And I'm like, you put 200 hours into it, you got your $60 worth. Like, yeah, sorry about it. And then that's when they start whining, you know, and World of Warcraft, I think, is like this as well. A lot of times or, you know, games like, you know, Overwatch or League of Legends or Fortnite or something like that, where it's yeah. they you put a little bit of money into it and then you do the things and then you're like, well, now I'm sometimes I, I think those games like the hardcore community can be a little bit just like I think the constant monetization of it leads to people being more invested in it, which leads to them getting more frustrated if it's not hitting exactly how they want it to hit because they look back and are like, you know, for me, Destiny 2, I'm sure if I added up all of the expansions that I've bought over the past 10 years or whatever it's been, that'd be a lot of money. But yeah. I feel like I've gotten my money's worth out of them. Uh, but a lot of people can look back on it and be like, Ugh, how dare they, you know? Well, I can see how, like, the stream of content can lead to you expecting them to somehow achieve the perfect flow of content for you specifically. Yeah. Rather than the more realistic expectation of, like, it'll come out when it's ready and we want it to be good and do you just keep, you know, plugging away at what you're doing? Like, yeah, I think yeah. the only, like, positive way to spin that or, like, benefit of the doubt way would be you know they're just the most passionate fans of that property and so when it's not living up to their hopes and dreams they get upset yeah. but even at but like, even that's even not like at, an excuse to flame creators or well something, no like but... and, and at that point it's like they're not making that game just for you mm-hmm. like the one to five to maybe ten percent of the like hardcore hardcore like they're making it for everybody, the whole player base, and they're actually making it hoping to bring new players in to increase their profits. So, like, mm-hmm. expectations definitely get out of whack. I mean, it's the whole thing of, like, tunnel vision or having yeah. blinders on. Like, they can't see the big picture. So, like, and that's that's another topic that kind of runs yeah. adjacent <laughs> to this one. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I think there definitely are some bad examples, too, of, you know, we talked about Skull and Bones, Suicide Squad, Avengers, Concord. Well, what is what do you the, think is the difference? Because as you were mentioning, like the good examples, I think it, it comes down to 
the that being the goal for the project from the beginning, I mm-hmm. think it comes down to how many games do you like I think that Anthem, for example, could have actually been a decent live service game. Yeah. But they just fumbled it so hard with the launch, with their content yeah. roadmap, with the lack of like actual gameplay in the game at launch. And so it was like they had an idea that could have potentially worked in this market, but they just they just failed at execution. Yeah. Who who makes Destiny 2? Bungie. 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 They used to make okay. it. Yeah. Okay. Because I was thinking also, because it might have to do with like what a studio is known for. Mm-hmm. Like when Anthem came out, it was people wanting more Mass Effect. And they're like, well, yeah, but also Anthem, look at this new thing we're doing where we can get a lot of money from you. And people are like, that's not what we expect well, from that, you. That was the other part of Anthem was they're like, well, it's going to have all the like shooty robot missions and stuff but guess what you get to go back to this hub and and have all the awesome bioware character interactions that you know and love and they tried to like give people both worlds which yeah. again they didn't do either one enough and so yeah. yeah so i feel like part of it's studio expectation too like what because it can feel like your studio is selling out if yeah. they do that like if naughty dog were to make a live service game set in the universe of the last of us how much of a cash grab would that feel like well they tried to and it got canceled their multiplayer thing that they were making yeah. was i don't know that it was going to necessarily be live service but it was definitely going to be more in that vein as a multiplayer project and they couldn't get it to work and so they canceled it but i, I think you're right like studios knowing their audience and their demographic is important like if blizzard puts out another mmo or live service thing or whatever people are like well Maybe you should focus on all the ones you have going now, but sure, I'll give it a shot because Blizzard yeah. fans are already used to that. <laughs> yeah. They're already in enough pain. <laughs> yeah, they're already used right. to getting raked over the coals. Like, come on. <laughs> well, and, and I think you you make a good point too, ju- though, of just like not every type or style of game works for a live service model. For sure. Because a lot of the a lot of the live service games in us to me essentially are trying to sort of ape MMOs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where it's kind of got that, like you go into, dun- you get gear, you go into dungeons or, you know, and the ultimate goal is some big like raid boss or something like that. And they kind of, and a lot of stuff does not lend itself well to that. For and sure. those games are very hard to do because there haven't, been a ton of successful mmos you know like there Mm -hmm. there was that period of time in the like mid 2000 mid to late 2000s where there was like the mmo rush where everything was a a wow killer and i'm pretty sure almost none of those was great (laughs) right (laughs) but i you know most of those i don't think are around anymore um and so it's it's one of those where like the Avengers, I think, is a great example where it's just like, why did it need to follow that sort of games as a service model? You know, like mm-hmm. Suicide Squad I, is an even better example yeah. because at least I've in never, the Avengers, I mean, like at least in the Avengers, they tried to give up. I felt like the the team at Crystal Dynamics was fighting f- to make a game that they would actually be proud of. And like they, they created each character with unique move sets and personalities and tried to make them in suicide squad. They're putting like the Joker on like a hobgoblin glider so that he can do the sunset overdrive, like bouncing around the city because that's the gameplay they chose to have. And mm-hmm. it's like all the characters move like that. King shark is like bouncing across the city and gliding around the city. And it's just like, Is that the Suicide Squad do that? Is that them? (laughs) Or did they just take a game concept and slap a property on it that was popular when James Gunn's movie came out? But people are like kind of like whatever about Suicide Squad. I do think Avengers suffered from really bad timing because they it that came out shortly after the Spider-Man games, right? 
Uh, y- yes, because when they put Spider-Man in the Avengers, that was the final nail in the coffin. But that, like that was a whole nother saga of he was going to be <laughs> Sony exclusive. You had to be on PlayStation to get Spider-Man. But then I think they walked that back after the game was so bad. Then they released him and he was just awful and terrible to play. And um, mm-hmm. it came at really bad timing because Marvel and the Avengers were at like peak popularity and they released yeah. like this dumpster fire cash yeah. grab. Yeah, and I think it pulled too many casuals into this space who are kind of shocked by live service as a concept, too. Yeah. Well, and I think there's this, like, back in the day, and this does this is not meant to be, like, ah, back in our day, but, like... The, <laughs> but it will be. The, I want you to work the really way, hard to make it not sound like that. <laughs> the way that a lot of stuff happened was, like, the game would come out, and then you'd maybe get a couple of DLCs, right? Yeah. Which is kind of like, like, you know, the beginnings maybe of live service where, you know, game companies were like, oh, you'll pay, you know, another 20 bucks for this. But something like, let's say Baldur's Gate 3, they're not going to do this. But if Baldur's Gate 3 every year just released a new expansion or something like that, where you could get more story uh, or another, you know, campaign to play through or something like that. People would pay for that. And that would kind yeah. of be live servicey, but they would be doing it in a way that made sense for that game. Right. Mm-hmm. And so I guess my, some of my thing is like, we've shifted so much into this live service model where a lot of these games would probably be way more successful if they would just be a traditional game and have DLC, you know? Yeah. Definitely. Um, like, like here's a story, like the Avengers game you know like boom have your avengers game don't make it some live service bs and then release like spider-man dlc which comes with like you know a short little six hour campaign or whatever it is and you can play a spider-man in the main game now or do this or you know um and and i know that that probably does not quite make them back the money you know a big part of live service is you're playing it, you're putting more time into it, you're making maybe more microtransactions. Like the more time, I'm sure there's research out there that says the more time that you're putting in this game, the more that you're playing it, the more likely you are to purchase microtransactions and that sort of thing, which I think is ultimately why they do this. But there's also research showing that like a very small fraction of people come back for DLC. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that was... My thought was, you know, you you get through your 40, 80 hour campaign, you put the game down and then you find out in three months that DLC is being released. And you're like, eh, did I enjoy it enough to spend another 25, 30 bucks? Yeah, it's the diehards like me who I played all the like Spider-Man DLCs. I've obviously played The Witcher, but then like transitioning into like The Witcher who did it right. They released two amazing like ones i would call an expansion one is like a dlc where you get more story content in the same world people hold those up especially blood and wine as like the pinnacle but i am i wonder how many if you ask just your average witcher 3 player how many people have actually played those and how many people yeah. finish the base game mm-hmm. yeah well i you've, you've got me thinking right now so i'm gonna look up real quick while you guys talk oh, like the like the completion the, the on achievements Xbox. yeah so, yeah because be- but a part of that is DLC became so muddy as like a term because you could get the crappy mm-hmm. rock steady like, oh, you can play f- five and a half minutes as Catwoman. That's our expansion. Or mm-hmm. you could get like the Skyrim expansions that like added a bunch of game mechanics and added a bunch of new storylines and like a whole new island to explore. And but they were both under that same umbrella of like DLC and a lot of times cost the same amount of money. And so it's hard to navigate. Yeah, yeah, I do think of I I think it was like Arkham Knight was around when I noticed people getting really like cheesed off about DLC and stuff because you know, they'll talk about launching a game or whatever and they'll be like with planned DLC coming in whatever time. And in theory, that should be like, "Oh, sweet, there's going to be more like more game to play and you know, additional story that that'll be nice to know if I like really enjoy this. Like if any of the Tomb Raider games release DLC, sure, yeah. I'd pick it up and play it. But it also leads to the like, okay, so why isn't it in the game at launch? Like, Yeah, like did you withhold what, this? Yeah. Yeah. 
which, you know, might be unfair. Like, I get the point of announcing planned DLC so people are aware and try and, you know, stick with it or pay attention or all that good stuff. But there is a certain amount of, like, especially with, like, pre-order bonuses type stuff. Yeah, see, that's yeah. the kind of garbage it, horse armor DLC crap that, like, yeah. like you said, soured the community. I think it makes more sense to do, like, what The Witcher did, what Elden Ring did of, like, here is yeah. your game, your full experience. And now we're going to take some ideas and some things that didn't fit yeah. in there and we're going to create this other thing on the side and then we're going to tell you about that and make a big deal about that and then you can play that if you want to and it's actually mm -hmm. a substantial fulfilling um, yeah. a piece of content. Yeah, now I did look it up. I couldn't figure out how to do it on just Xbox so I did it on True Achievements. So 38% of people finished The Witcher 3 according to true achievements and that's probably a little bit higher than it actually is uh for like just everybody on xbox because of like true achievements is probably people a actually more being hardcore to true achievements yeah yeah mm -hmm. and that's just on xbox as well yeah yeah and so there were 253,000 people that have linked this game on true achievements but the dlcs are like sitting around 50,000 each or no. Mm. Yeah. Like 50, 60,000 each. So it's like a quarter. About so yeah. yeah. So, I mean like that does, you know, agree with what you were kind of talking about there, Andrew of, you know, people don't necessarily go and play the DLCs and, you know, and I think there's some, some merit to that too. Um, Cause yeah, like it does kind of feel like a lot of these games want you to, play them and only them they know? don't want you to stop yeah because if exactly. you stop then they they can't get you back so they right. try to mm -hmm. keep you in this the grind the loop chasing the rewards and i think a lot of that kind of came from the mobile game of like we're going to give you these you can play with a full lives for an hour or whatever like you can you know just the, some of the mobile mobile game trappings of like you said earlier dylan fomo of like yeah oh if i if i don't you have all these timed missions and like in Fortnite or you, you like i need to hit all of these missions by the end of this week so i can get this cool new skin for free and then i need to hit all these other like big goals over this season path pass period so that i can get all these cool rewards or b so that i can justify spending the 10 15 dollars that i spent on the premium season pass i have to play the game now so that i unlock the stuff that i paid for yeah mm -hmm. but and and i do feel like i care a little bit less in the free-to-play space like oh, fortnite sure. fortnite is free you know yes. and so it's like you know they do a lot of the games as a service stuff where it's like they have seasons if you miss that season there's no going back like you can't play the old seasons in Fortnite, as far as i'm aware you know if you miss out on getting spider gwen as like the battle pass or whatever like you better hope she comes around in the shop if you really want her but you know yeah, they also have, have so many her. skins yeah, yeah like um but at the same time it is a free-to-play game you don't need any of that there's no benefit to having any of that other than doesn't it affect the game you play. happy yeah 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 and so i do give it a little bit more of a pass in you know like that kind of a setting um but i definitely do see you know fortnite wants itself to be the game that you play you know um and i think i think some of it too is we're getting into this space where it's like they've figured out like oh games as a service make money you know at least the good ones Mm -hmm. but there's only so much time and attention that people have right you know like nobody nobody is playing video games for like it, like we've got what 160 something hours a week 168 or something like that hours in a week nobody is playing 168 hours of video games a week you know like i hope nobody um, healthy. <laughs> <laughs> uh but like there's there's only so much time and attention that people have and it feels like e at this point every single game is fighting to be the only game that gets your attention and it's like well i like to play other games you know and well, definitely I think every game in this space yeah yeah 
like there are you know definitely games that come out that are not that um you know sony games nintendo games a lot of those are yeah like uh, spider-man 2 came out and you can platinum that thing in like 30 hours and then you're done like yeah but i guess that's kind of the thing too is like you know people are willing to pay money for spider-man i don't know if i assume sony like recouped its costs with that oh yeah with spider-man yeah for sure (laughs) (laughs) but you know it's it's one of those things too where i think games are getting more and more expensive and people were already upset enough when the 70 dollars price hike came around that i understand them looking for some way to continue to make revenue and we don't like to just you know not get anything and so games as a service i understand how we got there where it's like what if we keep trickling out some content to you and you keep paying us money like i get that I, and it I makes think sense on paper yeah it's just it's so very it's got to be good <laughs> yeah executed <laughs> you know? yeah. well and once you have destiny 2 as a juggernaut and you have these yeah. free-to-play options like fortnite as a juggernaut and then you come in and you try to compete i mean you even have overwatch 2 makes this a bad example but like you had overwatch which is the trend that people are chasing now with like concord you yeah. release concord which is locked to one platform it's got an aesthetic and a tone that nobody wants like nobody's really into you charge money up front for it when its competitors are free. Mm-hmm. And, well, and you're just remaking kind of the same game. I'm sure there are things about it that were well, like yeah, that's unique, my thing is like people are going to be like, well, why would I yeah. go through all those hurdles when I could just play the other version that's already proven itself? Why I'll yeah, just well, stick mm-hmm. with my Overwatch or I'll just stick with my Destiny or I'll just stick with my yeah. Fortnite. And you have all these other games trying to ape those, but doing a worse job. That's why I think that something like Skull and Bones if done well could have actually been cool and could make a decent live service or MMO style game. Like the pirate aesthetic and tone and like you're running a ship, you know, rather than you are a guy with gun with your other four friends with gun pushing a payload. I mean, like how many times has that been done? But Ubisoft, again, they just fumbled so hard with that game. Yeah. I mean, Ubisoft, kind of just does that though at this point <laughs> so yeah ubisoft is kind of like the new ea i guess yeah i was gonna say the the only one only series i feel like that they can consistently do okay with is assassin's creed and even that they kind of stumbled on with uh mirage so you know yeah i mean i think that and this is a whole nother conversation i think that the industry <laughs> And the gamers just love to have their like dog piles. And right now it's Ubisoft. But mm-hmm. honestly, like, sure, you can definitely critique them for their games being formulaic. But like, Far Cry 6 was fine, like, decent game. The Avatar game was fine. The Star Wars Outlaws has really just become like the. Yeah. Which, punch by all bag. accounts, are being it's, weird it's about fine. That. I, th- I think it will be fine. I think the like performance stuff that it launched with is the biggest like it looked kind of like assassin's creed unity where like that game was so janky but i played it and had a fine time but like that game was undefendably like broken for a lot of people and but now like it's fine you go back and play it they fix it i think uh star wars will be the same way but also like um ubisoft does the tom clancy stuff Rainbow Six, that's a live service game that is very, very popular. The Division 2 did really well. And so... They can do it. Yeah. Even For Honor is still chugging along after all these years. That yeah. like medieval fighting mm-hmm. game, basically. Mm-hmm. Like, there are... I think you hit the nail on the head when you were basically like, do something new and unique with it. Don't try to ape something that is already out and then release your game when did overwatch 2 come out like two years ago a year ago it was at least two at this point i mean we yeah we went back and looked at when our quarry episode came out we were shocked so i'm sure overwatch 2 is like two (laughs) or three years old at this point yeah but like that game comes comes out and then like two years later they release concord which is a 40 dollar version of a free game that locked to a single console yeah Yeah. and and so it's just kind of like well 
you know, why? Similar to like First Descendant, um, which you and I played earlier this year. Yeah. Um, a little bit of. We messed around in it. It was, you know, very similar to like a Destiny style of experience. Very simple me- compared to yeah, uh, like gameplay simple, simple uh, systems overly convoluted. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But that was definitely like a games as a service. There was a lot of like mobile game kind of BS in it. Mm-hmm. And you just fell off completely. You didn't like go back to Destiny or anything. I pretty much just was like, yep, I'm just going to go play Destiny now because like, well, I, this I is, did play this a little bit of Destiny. I played. Yeah. I played Destiny for a couple of weeks and <laughs> bought Lightfall for like 10 bucks or whatever, but I still nice. haven't played Lightfall. So, yeah. But yeah, I mean, like it's it's one of those where it's like that game came out. People were like, this is cool, kind of. But then it was like, well, Destiny already does that. What it had going for it was that it's completely free to play, you know, um, versus yeah, Destiny, it, which just, like you do have to buy expansions for. You could jump into the first Descendant and just try it. I, another kind of thing that I don't necessarily like about this trend, and I guess this is a not necessarily one to one with what we we're talking about, like the the shifting of existing games. So like Call of Duty, mm-hmm. I installed Call of Duty because it's on Game Pass now. And yeah. I am not going to do the work to try to figure out how to unlock things in Modern Warfare 3. Like I found yeah. a loadout that works for me and like numbers are going up and they keep telling me to buy the season pass. But like they have made it so convoluted to like unlock yeah. guns and unlock things on the battle pass and whatever. And I'm like... I just want to see, I just want to unlock things at a steady rate as I put, like, I just want the old Call of Duty experience. And I think about Halo Infinite too, which did it much less egregiously, but almost kind yeah. of on the Similar. other side, they didn't really give you any rewards hardly. Like it was super yeah, slow going to try to earn anything in that game. Yeah. I will shout me- them out because they did let you buy the battle pass. And then once you had it, you could always play through it uh, yeah which is something that i feel like more games need to do hell divers um, did that as well not a they are i, I guess hell divers is uh, the, they would be a live service game that did something different because they're not yeah. like their yep. gameplay was still guys with guns but like what you're doing you're playing as a team you can hurt your teammates uh there's a lot of comedy you know you're working to kind of take uh defend the earth from the yeah two different threats like they they had and i mean that game fell off as well no matter how great you are like that's yeah. that's the hard thing about live service is maintaining that level of excellence and yeah like, well and i think that's like the core of the issue is that by and large the average gamer seems to want it, and I could be wrong, but this is my perception. The average gamer seems to want to be free to kind of play whatever. You know, they don't want to necessarily be locked into a single game. Yeah. Yeah. And with a lot of these games as a service, it is, hey, don't go, you know, don't go play this other game. You know, like Helldivers wanted you to just keep playing hell divers and and so like it's created this trend where like people look at whether or not a game is successful by whether or not people are still playing it at the same like level they were at launch and so like hell divers which was crazy at launch has now fallen off there's still plenty of people that play it uh you know according to eric uh from wait for it you know like he doesn't have any issues getting into like a lobby or anything right but the narrative around Helldivers is that game is dead because not as many people are playing it. What? And it's like, well, Hyperbole no, like, in gaming? Yeah. <laughs> but it, it's like, you know, like, hey, most people don't, you know, like, there definitely are people, you know, like Joe, who is very much like World of Warcraft is his game. There That's are, what I was thinking is like people yeah. have their comfort games. Like for you, yeah. you could yeah. say it's Destiny or like Monster Hunter. For me, it's The Witcher. It's like a story yeah. like narrative game. And so there are enough people whose comfort game is a like Call, Call of, of Duty, Duty or, or something. a Hell Divers or whatever to like keep those communities alive. But yeah. the boom that you get, like I picked up Hell Divers because of all the positive reception around it, and because you know Phil and Eric were playing and stuff, and it was only forty bucks. Yeah, but I 
didn't get hardcore into it. I played it for a few weeks and that was about it for me. And well, yeah, yeah. I, I feel like I got my money's worth, but like that's not my forever game. Obviously, things do better if the barrier for entry is lower. Like more people are going to check out a free to play game, which means statistically more people are going to click with that. If there is the barrier of 40 bucks for entry, then you've got to convince someone to spend 40 bucks and then maybe the game just doesn't click for them. Like all of our comfort games are such different outrageous games, which speaking of a game that probably shot for what have been my idea of a very happy medium in terms of like continual content and expected updates and whatnot was Mass Effect Andromeda. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But they just fucked it up so badly. Yeah, Yeah, they tried again with Anthem. (laughs) Like I was going to say, those were the dark days of EA. Uh, EA has kind of made a little bit of a comeback in recent years, but yeah, that was rough. Which like, if... The game had been better and like had earned the audience better. I think it like a massive a game set in the Mass Effect universe with continual planets to explore and, you know, planned consistent updates and the story progressing with finding the various arcs and all that kind of stuff could have been really great. They just did such a bad job. Yep. Well, around that time you had Mass Effect promising that you had destiny um destiny one i think had come out right around then or maybe it was destiny two well, you had i'm like just thinking back to the days of like destiny one in concept and then like grand theft auto online and like you kind of had these ideas and promises of the game that you love continue Forever. yeah carrying <laughs> on just getting mm-hmm. updates in mm-hmm. some cases you could play it with your friends you know like grand theft auto online or like destiny And the idea, like, again, the idea, the concept on paper actually sounds really awesome, but that was before we just kind of saw all the potential negatives to that, which is, yeah, it's hard to make these games at this level. And so that continual content is just, Mm -hmm. it's either off in quality. Usually it either falls off in quality or it falls off in like consistency Mm -hmm. and I mean, like, if you look at the GTA Five storyline that you get when you play through the campaign, and then you look at the story stuff that you get if you play through the online, it's, like, dramatically different and worse. Well, and it was taking them, like, so long to release stuff that the way that they, like, fixed it was they just made everything egregiously expensive so that you had to keep playing GTA Online and right. running those same missions over and over and over again to grind up to even afford to buy the like cool new thing that they put in and, so that you could unlock it. Uh, and you know, like because they needed to pad the time that you had to do it, you know? And so. and we're talking about like one of the biggest video game companies on the planet, Rockstar. Rockstar had to they had a horrible launch with GTA Online. You couldn't even get in. And then what they launched with was super simple and bare bones, but we all loved it because we were playing Grand Theft Auto with our friends and actually doing missions instead of just doing the swing set glitch that we did in four. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but like the big thing was heists. Heists yeah. are coming. We're going to let you do heists with your friends and that's going to be amazing. And how long did it take for heists to finally come at to the game? At least a year. At yeah, least it was year. at least a year. It was long enough that we had to like get the crew back together for heists. Like we had moved on from that game. And that's Rockstar. So it's like the biggest gaming company in the world with unlimited resources is still struggling with that promised content and just like consistent release of quality content. But then all these other little studios think that they can just kind of do it and become the next Fortnite. And I mean, look at Rocksteady, another incredible studio basically just can destroyed Mm -hmm. their reputation by making Suicide Squad. So crazy yep uh but uh ultimately i think where we it sounds like we kind of land is like we don't necessarily like hate every game just like just because a game is a live service game or a game as a service doesn't necessarily mean that we're gonna hate it or that it's not gonna be good it's just one of the red flags that gets sent up uh, of like hmm there's a like for aubrey you know 
this is a good chance that this game is going to have like an ongoing narrative potentially. And I kind of want a closed experience or, you know, just also knowing that like, oh, there's this there's a there's been a lot of games that have kind of fumbled the bag when it's been a games as a service. And so, you know, the chances of this game having issues or not being as good if it's a live service game, that chance goes up, you know. And I, th- mm-hmm. I think like I do think there are good live service games. I think live service games fill a really good niche of yeah a comfort game or like, you know, you can always go back to Destiny 2 and yeah. have a good time well, with that gameplay loop. But I think the problem for me comes in because the industry is so hyper fixed on it and chasing that trend right now that they're just ruining they're either not pursuing other ideas or they're like ruining potentially interesting ideas like skull and bones or even a suicide squad game set in the arkham universe by trying to shoehorn this gameplay and monetization model into it and it's just it, it's making it's making the triple a game seen very uninteresting right now and mm-hmm. like very yeah and un- like just kind of frustrating because you want to get excited about the like shiniest most expensive like peak kind of video games but when they're just not interesting or you know you're not getting a full experience or you know it's going to be a disaster launch or you know that it could be such a better game if it was more traditional or a different kind of gameplay structure like it just it gets kind of frustrating and old yeah yeah they're fine as a part of the games industry as like an option for gamers but it shouldn't be the only option (laughs) To rephrase it in a online discussion for your art history course kind of way, it's <laughs> it's a trend. I don't have a problem with it existing or it even being a substantial part of the industry, but it is a trend that I am riding out right now. Like I'm I'm ready for developers to realize that no, this is not what works for us. Time to move on to something else. Unlike yeah. Demure, which is a trend that I absolutely hate and <laughs> <laughs> wish it didn't exist. <laughs> yeah. Well, let us know what you think of live service games in our Discord uh, or in the comments. Um, let us know uh, whether you like them, what are some good examples, what are some bad examples. If you do absolutely hate them, what is your suggestion for how studios can still make money? so that we can still get cool games because this is one of their their things that they're trying out so that they don't have to charge us a hundred dollars a game or not make games anymore you know Hint, uh, the so. answer is scale back <laughs> but gamers <laughs> so. also don't want to hear that so yeah. what no but yeah so good discussion yeah i liked it i think that was a a good topic worth talking about probably one that will still be relevant in a few years but hopefully with like we're talking about trends, hopefully a while back Battle Royale's worthy multiplayer trend. Now it's like team shooters. Hopefully we'll kind of see the live service trend. We'll see some of, I mean, I do feel like we're living in it right now with all these games just kind of bombing all these layoffs. Like this is the painful course correction. Yeah. We're kind of in that stage. Hopefully what that leads to is more interesting ideas experimentation in like game design and hopefully what it doesn't lead into is just another trend pops up and they all just chase that and like in five to seven years we're playing a bunch of hell divers clones but we're all kind of over yeah. that like <laughs> yeah yeah i will be playing my 3ds still <laughs> <laughs> All right, so with all that being said, let's go ahead and roll into our closing segment for this episode. So, Dylan, are you going to bring the game that you uh couldn't bring last week because you had no internet uh yes nice yes i am (laughs) we we just played 20 questions well we played 100 questions ah gotcha and i learned i I need to make it a lot harder yeah i need need to make it a lot harder in the future (laughs) 
All right. We have a stream. Yes. Um, so I made this, <laughs> this little categories. thing. So I made this uh, thing inspired. I forget what their channel is, but it's inspired by these guys that do like movie grids that I see on TikTok. Um, so it's basically like a That's TikTok their channel, board. movie grids I see on TikTok. So we are going to, I do have this. I figure we could post it on like Instagram. So sure. if you're interested in playing along, go to our Instagram, which is what, Andrew? Your Friendly Neighborhood Gamers. Okay. Uh, <laughs> your Friendly Neighborhood Gamers. Uh, and you can look at it. Uh, I'm going to read the the different topics though. So how this is going to work, um, each square has like two things uh like each row is labeled and each column is labeled so yeah dylan put on the screen a square with like a tic-tac-toe board over it yeah, so just basically. for the audio it's a listener three by three yeah. grid yeah. yeah um so the the rows are nintendo ex- uh, first party games xbox first party games and playstation first party games and then the columns are troy baker 2015 to 2020 and games that got over a nine on IGN. Oh man, I don't know. You picked Andrew's favorite video game voice actor. I may have a hard time. I did pick him intentionally because I knew Andrew didn't like him and I figured you'd have an advantage <laughs> in that column. <laughs> so like replaying Death Stranding, I'm like, God, this guy. <laughs> he's just playing himself he in that game. Upon himself. Yeah, he's such a pretentious <laughs> piece of work. Well, the I mean, he is in Death Stranding, yeah, no, which it, in it itself is a whole pretentious piece of work. So. He fits in that game for sure, but like they didn't even try to change his face or anything. Like it's just Troy Baker in that game. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so I've got uh, different numbers of points in all of them based on what my subjective opinion of their <laughs> a Nintendo Troy be. Baker game. Is like <laughs> the most, yeah, <laughs> I think there are two two games that troy baker has been in that were nintendo first party games yeah that's uh, tough. and so Oof. so i was like the xbox the playstation ones those will be decently easy i think anyway right. how we're gonna do this is we're gonna let you guys start and you're gonna tell me like which one you want to guess and there are multiple answers obviously for like you know there were multiple first party playstation games that came out between 2015 and 2020 so as long as you give me one of them that fits then you can get your points and i've got uh i've got my tabs open so i can look up like ign's reviews and okay okay and uh what year games came out <laughs> so <laughs> the 2015 2020 is like the so it's through like 2019 and- right or does or 20, is it- is 2020 i was including 2020 okay in i just um, wanted to verify that yeah. before we started okay yeah so, uh, we'll we'll let Aubrey pick first. Oh well, yeah. um, <laughs> I'm gonna do Nintendo 2015 to 2020 and say Animal Crossing: New Horizons. That is correct. Animal Crossing. Are we playing tic tac toe? New... No. Okay. You're just trying, You're to, get just trying to get points. Uh, so <laughs> Aubrey, <laughs> that's a terrible spot for me to go for playing tic tac toe. <laughs> Yeah, so you you get uh, four points. Can one of you keep track of the scores? scores? Yeah. And I am going to... Oh. Ooh. Wow. Audio Perfect listeners design really is my... missing out. <laughs> Except <laughs> you're all audio listeners, because even on YouTube, we don't... <laughs> we could be... Look. Well... I'm not capturing this right now. I was going to no, say, may put the thing up. capturing this? I may put the thing up so that they can see like the graphic on YouTube for I the, mean if like, we start doing more like visual games then maybe yeah. we'll kind of come up with something for YouTube integration a little bit but I think that would be if this is like a consistent thing that we do. Yeah. Um yeah. Xbox IGN 9 or above. Okay. Mm-hmm. And this is exclusive, right? The Xbox f- first party. So probably exclusive but some of their games may wind up on like pc or whatever and some of them now are winding up on like playstation and nintendo but right as long as it is an x part xbox first party game okay um which way do i want to go with this let's say halo 3 
Yes. So Halo 3 got a 9.5 from IGN. Nice. Wow. So, so that will be... There were not a ton of like Xbox first party games just in general. Uh, yeah. And then... I was trying to... Th- I thought... I was, First I was thinking like Gears 5, but I was like, no, that... Instead of risking that as a potential guess, I'll just go back to like peak Halo days. <laughs> yeah. All right, yeah, I think it was like Halo 2, 3, 4, and 5 reached or it. maybe just four or reach as well um, as yeah reach but, was going to be my other guess but i was like i know three was like the end of the trilogy so people probably three in my opinion was p Halo. so <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> all right i'll do xbox 2015 to 2020 okay and guess uh hellblade senua's sacrifice um senua's sacrifice came out in 2017 so mm-hmm. yes that will count right there right. in the middle Aubrey's tying it up. Um, yeah. I'm putting up some big numbers. <laughs> let me do. Well, I'll just go ahead and do Troy Baker PlayStation with Death Stranding. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. Of all the things, Death Stranding. Because I'm like basically Uncharted name, Four. Yeah, the you Last can name of Us. Anyone. The Last of Us Two. <laughs> oh yeah, true. He, he is in like all PlayStation <laughs> like games, which is Death why Stranding it is. Of the Last of us. <laughs> yeah. I I did not make that one very many points because I was like any PlayStation game, God of War, Death Stranding's better than The Last of Us, so I'll just <laughs> whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just kick that hornet's nest real quick. <laughs> All right, I'm back to you, Aubrey. The Arkham games weren't console locked, huh? No. I don't know. <laughs> they were not. <laughs> I'm having a really hard time thinking of a. Uh, both a Nintendo and a Xbox first party that Troy Baker was in. I can get. I'm. I'm willing to give some hints if you need or want hint. Like you can ask for a hint, one oh. hint per. Oh, um, I think I'm going to go ahead and get my tic tac toe though, and I'll go PlayStation 2015 to 2020 and say The Last of Us Part Two. Uh, I'm pretty sure that came out, but I mean, yeah, look, it was because I 2020. Don't know. That was part two, you said? Yeah. That one and Ghost of Tsushima both came out in 2020. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. Because now I'm remembering like when we redid our 2020 rankings and I looked at it and I was like, well, once I finish Death Stranding and actually play other PlayStation games, I may have to revisit this list. (laughs) Death Stranding came out in 2019, I think. Yeah. Okay. So that puts Aubrey at... So Aubrey is tying it up again. 12 Mm -hmm. v 12. And I got tic tac toe. Um, I win. <laughs> <laughs> I will go PlayStation IGN nine or above. Okay. I will go with God of War twenty eighteen. Mm. I can guarantee that it is, but I will verify. <laughs> yes, ten out of ten. <laughs> God of War twenty eighteen. The the. Placed or the yeah the PlayStation one not worth a whole lot of points for the IGN uh, just because uh, IGN loves PlayStation. <laughs> so. Yeah, most of the games industry does. Yeah, I could have gone Astrobot and done something real recent. True, mm. true. But I honestly haven't looked at reviews for that game. I just saw like the aggregate yeah. score. <laughs> I'm yeah, pretty it's sure high. it's nine something. Yeah. yeah, so it's up there. Um, I'll go with Nintendo, IGN, nine or above, and say Super Mario Odyssey. That is also true. <laughs> yeah. Let me find what the actual score was. Pretty sure it was 10 out of 10. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure. That and Breath of the Wild, same year. Crazy. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. 10 out of 10, Mario Odyssey. So that is three points for Aubrey as well, keeping it tied up. So I want to just bring the listeners up to speed here. Aubrey and I are tied, each have 15 points, and the only two squares <laughs> left on the board are the Nintendo Nintendo Troy Baker game for 10 points. Yeah. Or the Xbox Troy Baker game for 6 points. And I'm going to go Dylan did say we could have hints, but I'm still <laughs> cuz it's like at this point do I try to take the easier question and think that Aubrey will whiff or try to take the harder one and get it and, and guarantee it a victory? Yeah. 
Guess it depends how many hints Dylan's willing to give us. He said we could have one hint. One hint? He said he would give us a hint. I would give each of you one hint. Well, right, yeah, like we each get a hint for... For the category. If we whiff it, is it dead or does the other person get to guess it? Uh, The other person can still guess it with that that hint that you... With that information. The problem is I'm just having a hard time thinking of Xbox first party games, period. (laughs) You and... (laughs) <laughs> pretty much every xbox fan <laughs> and i say that with love xbox uh, what do you have other than halo i'm gonna go um. <laughs> xbox troy baker and i'm gonna ask does it have to be out yet <laughs> does it have to be released uh, are you are you gonna guess indiana jones <laughs> yeah. um, i'll let you guess indiana jones okay, that's yeah. fair that's fine indiana jones i i'm yeah i could have racked my brain and tried to remember if he was in like gears or wolfenstein or uh so he was in a halo game i think he was in like halo 4 as like just an extra voice um he was in diablo 4 uh which i would have accepted because i believe xbox owned it when that came out yeah he was in fable 3 which i think was like the biggest the only fable i've played Mm. and then he was in I think he, I don't think he was in a Gears game. Um, Well, and I'm sure he's done like a shit ton of like Walla Walla and like background, you know, merchant number three or whatever for. Yeah, additional hmm, voices. Any number, like that was honestly bread and butter until. Yeah. Well, and a lot of that though wasn't like Xbox though. Yeah. You know, Um, he didn't do a ton, ton, like Fable was one. He was in Halo 4. He was in. Like a lot of his stuff though was third party. Yeah. Like it it wasn't like Sony is the main one that he's done like a bunch of first, first party, party stuff yeah. for. But this this freaking Harrison Ford impression that he's doing for a whole game, I mean <laughs> I remember you watching that and being like, Is that Troy Baker? <laughs> I was like, so it's offended. it sounds like Troy Baker trying to do Harrison Ford. <laughs> and I don't know if I can listen to that for a whole game. Yep. I also don't know if I'll want to play that game the whole way through. We'll just have to see how how it yeah. goes. I am going to install it. I'm going to try it, and we will see. Well, all right, Aubrey, Nintendo Troy Baker for ten points. Oof. <laughs> What's my hint, Dylan? All right, so there are three games that oh, Nintendo uh, uh, Troy Baker has done voices for for Nintendo. One of them is. A Mario like crossover game. A Mario one of them like crossover game. One of this them is, a big is hint. it's a huge hint. One of them is a is a series that Caleb really likes. Or I assume he really likes it because <laughs> he's the only person I hear that talks about it. Uh and then one of them is a game that had a sequel announced pretty recently. Uh <laughs> Shoot, I think I know the Caleb one because I think it gets mentioned in Yakuza Like a Dragon. <laughs> what? <laughs> what is it called? A Mario like crossover. Well, it's got it's a Mario crossover. Oh, it's like it's a got Mario, Mario in crossover. It. But it, it's not like a mainline Mario title, which I guess is probably obvious because they don't speak in those games. Um, but. Is it like Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games? Like, does he voice one of the Sonic characters? That's it. <gasps> oh, my God. <laughs> Mar- Mario and Sonic at the London 2012 Olympic Games. He voices Espio the Chameleon. <laughs> I was thinking uh, that maybe I was going to get you in a well actually moment if it was the Mario and Rabbids. Mm. Yeah. And you were going to be like, actually, it's. Ubisoft. That's Ubisoft, the game company that everybody loves to hate. What? What? <laughs> it's like Hero Story or something. What's the one that Caleb probably knows? Kid Icarus. Oh. He was. It, he did a voice in a Kid Icarus that game. Is That's not crazy. what I was thinking of. No, I would never. I was thinking. <laughs> and then he, I was thinking of one he, that like got movie releases. It's like huge in Japan and it like barely uh, a blip in the U.S. The other one that I found was Metroid Prime 3. Um, he voiced mm. various soldiers in Metroid Prime 3. Yeah, when you said the sequel thing, I was like, I thought Metroid, but I was like, I 
not sure which I, Metroid it would have been. I was shocked. Like when I came up with that category, I was like, he's probably been in one of the Fire Emblem games because like there's so many yeah. characters in those games. Uh, and then I was shocked that he was not in any of those that I could find. So, well, Aubrey cinched it with that uh, generous hint. Incredibly generous. 25 to 21. <laughs> I will share the victory uh, with you, Andrew. <laughs> that was a that was a fun game. I like that. Yeah. We may do it more. Uh, at least uh, I'm adding it to my log of various games. <laughs> so. It's a good it's a good concept that you can yeah, revisit pretty pretty readily. Pretty easily. And it the cross section helps really narrow down like trivia options which can be hard to do nice well uh that was it for this particular episode like dylan mentioned during the episode if you have any thoughts on this if you want to chat with us if you want to talk about live service games if you want to throw out your troy baker deep cuts (laughs) um (laughs) join our discord and do it there that's where we are that's where we chat where we hang out we are on social media but discord is the best place to find us in our community and actually have a conversation. As far as the podcast goes, we would really appreciate it if you enjoyed this episode or if you have enjoyed multiple episodes at this point to go give us a review or a rating on the podcasting apps that allow it. Dylan left a comment on our Spotify that I still have not been able to access because you have to like <laughs> sign into Spotify for podcasters. And like I created, created my Spotify account through Facebook like years ago, and that one's tied to level playing field. And I'm not sure how to get into the friendly neighborhood gamers one. So <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out how to get to where I can see Dylan's test comment, but apparently you can comment on Spotify. So, so if you want to do that, feel free and I'll probably read it in like a year or so when I figure out how to get into <laughs> that dashboard. Dylan, what's going on on YouTube? Um, so the YouTube channel uh is where we put all of our like shorter form content, but we also put our podcast out there, but we haven't been doing that since the beginning. So, uh if you are a primarily like YouTube podcast listener, uh some of our older episodes are slowly kind of trickling out there so you you'll get kind of like that as a bonus uh every like other week right now at the at the moment and so we're we're kind of pulling from some of our like more popular episodes and kind of just working down that list so feel free to check that out i think we recently put up a discussion on cozy games uh other than that we also do some like short reviews or video essays aubrey's got one that came out a little bit ago on grief and spirit fairer um andrew did a cool review on elsie um, that you can check out um i think the next thing like that'll be coming out when this episode comes out is a review of dredge i believe it may have or just it... come out yeah i don't remember that comes out this coming yeah that it will, it just will have just come have come out yeah last wednesday so uh check that out uh if you're interested in dredge um that could be kind of cool but if you do watch our youtube stuff as usual we'd always appreciate a like a comment subscribe to the channel etc anything that helps throw us into the algorithm last week when you weren't here i had aubrey plug youtube and it uh i may just clip her whole plug out and just use it as like a social media <laughs> ad for the youtube channel because it was pretty hilarious she's like we have youtube videos and there's a lot of souls like stuff on there <laughs> john did a much better job of uh, discussing our youtube content than i did for sure <laughs> <Oof>. <laughs> yeah I, I feel like that every time I'm like a guest on another podcast without Andrew and they ask me about our show and I'm like, Andrew usually answers this question. <laughs> what are, I don't know. I'm on a podcast, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Listen to it if you can find it. Yeah. I don't know that I said it, but the general vibe was, look, I'm on the show. I'm not a fan of the show. <laughs> yeah. I don't listen to our show. I'm there. What are you doing? At the videos. recording. <laughs> I, I gave them a pity subscribe way back when. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, on that note, uh, those of you that are listening and have listened all the way up to this point, we really appreciate it. Thank you for coming back for another one. I think this wraps up kind of our more 
uh, general scattershot kind of content for the year as we roll into some themed months and then the end of the year discussions. So excited for that. Excited to kick that off. Uh, I think unless I'm like got my dates wrong, our next episode will be kicking off like October spooky game season. So looking forward to that. But as far as this episode, thank you again so much for listening and we will catch you on the next one. To wrap up the we're back discussion, I looked it up. It was not a Don Bluth. It was an Amblimation, which was an offshoot of Amblin Entertainment, which I think was a project largely run, like headed up by Steven Spielberg after he left Don mm. Bluth Productions. Um, I guess he had a falling out with Don Bluth. And so they made the sequel to An American Tale. They made the We're Back film. Mm. And Fievel was their mascot. And the only other movie they made was the Balto movie. And then they oh. went defunct in 1997. Three bangers. <laughs> All right, now we'll catch you on the next one. (laughs) 